Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and today I'm going to talk about the film Pink Flamingos from 1972. And this is continuing my John Waters review series. I can't really think of a more John Waters film than Pink Flamingos. It's probably the film he's most known for other than Hairspray, and it's really the film that launched him. It's the reason I'm into him, and he became such a major director to me personally, and to Baltimore where I grew up, but it's also the film that made him infamous and famous it made him notorious it gave him a name it made you think this guy is gross disgusting ironic different and hilarious part of being an auteur is just showing someone authored a certain film and i think pink flamingo shows that there is a new auteur around for me when i was in middle school and really getting into movies and especially getting into cult movies because those were the movies that weren't safe i couldn't watch while my brother and sister were awake most of my parents would not let me watch at the time and maybe i shouldn't have been watching at the time and this seemed to be the ultimate one the one that still disgusted people that people were still shocked by that was controversial and everyone i know who had seen it, who was older, talked about gagging on the way home. So of course I had to see it. The most shocking thing and the most amazing thing about Pink Flamingos is how it still has that in it even today. A film from 1972 can still disgust me and still have the same reaction to a lot of scenes that people had in 1972 that I currently have in 2015. And honestly, I don't think will ever go away. If I'm ever too desensitized even to Pink Flamingos, obviously we've gone too far at that point. Divine, who is hiding out in a trailer in Maryland with a couple cotton played by Mary Vivian Pierce and crackers played by Danny Mills and her mother Edie played by Edith Massey. And Divine is considered the filthiest person alive and her group are the filthiest people alive. And they've been dubbed that by the Midnight Newspaper and the marbles Raymond and Connie both played by David Lockery and Mink Stoll hate that they are called the filthiest people alive and will compete with them and try to take them out to actually be and be given the title of the filthiest people alive and do all sorts of blackmail and fiendish things even though Divine is certainly filthy the marbles kidnap women hitchhiking and then impregnate them and sell their babies to lesbian couples and do all sorts of nasty things I think it's appropriate that a John Waters film would have two competing sides for the filthiest person alive. It's very much representative of his style. It's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. They're deciding on whose territory of the filthiest person alive. Except Divine's not as interested. It's like the evil marbles are coming after Divine, Cotton, Crackers, and Edie. There's no real way to describe this plot in a lot of ways. I guess that's the best way. Some of it doesn't make sense. I don't think the Eggman and Edie's relationship entirely makes sense. Probably the sweetest relationship of the movie. Much like his other films like Mondo Trasho and Multiple Maniacs. There is a central plot there, but there are some nonsensical elements to it. He still refers to his early period as kind of his film school, and it's still rough, but part of what makes a John Waters film special is actually the color to it. That intense pink, the hair that David Lockery and Mink Stoll have, Divine's red dress. It's very important. I think it made John Waters movies pop in the way the black and white ones don't. It's like when you watch his features, one doesn't have the dialogue so it doesn't feel as John Waters -y. the other one Multiple Maniacs doesn't have color and this one is like the entire package it's like his style is fully formed and coming out I think that's one of the things that makes this film so memorable I don't know many people who have seen it and don't have a very intense reaction of either love disgust or hate even when I looked at reviews on YouTube a lot of people extremely dislike it and don't get it obviously those people are really not hip and really stupid they're also probably guilty of assholeism. All film is different. All film can't be the same. I don't think John Waters movies should be like summer blockbusters. It's cool to have different types of movies. And that's kind of what Pink Flamingos represented to me. And as I was 13, just the beginning of this kind of rebellious period of my life, and you know, you have punk rock and you have rap music and I had all those things, but I didn't really have that with the movies and cult movies signified that. Even though John Waters was very much something my parents were into, it just felt like so cool to me it'll never stop with pink flamingos for me like i don't ever watch it with anyone because if they don't get it that would just be the worst fucking thing in the world to me this film can't be tarnished in a way and it's a weird film to hold sacred if you're into filmmaking at all in baltimore people are like oh you're gonna be the next john waters and then i'd watch pink flamingos and i'd be like well no one can ever top this and even the guys in jackass hold pink flamingos up 
on a pedestal. It had that dirty, grimy appeal. It was really one of the first big hit midnight movies, and it usually played at midnight. And this is before Rocky Horror. The thing about Pink Flamingos that I also like is that Rocky Horror could be a Glee episode. Time Warp gets played at bar mitzvahs. Nobody's like lining up to eat dog shit at a bar mitzvah or something. But I mean, the catering at that one was really bad, so I kind of think they did. You couldn't mainstreamify Pink Flamingos. It's too much of a fuck you, and it's too disgusting and disturbing. It's also so different at the time. This came out in 1972. That was like Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon period, and this is nothing like that. It was kind of the end of the hippies, but the hippie stuff was still kind of sticking around. You can tell from the hairstyles and stuff, but this is doing the 50s thing before that even came back. This is pre-American graffiti and happy days. I grew up in Baltimore. You had somebody like Barry Levinson, and he even won an Oscar for Best Director, but nobody had the name he did, and I think it's because he invented his own kind of a movie. He is an auteur. You can tell he made a John Waters film. And Pink Flamingos is so much more of that. I can't think of a film that's more of a cult, dangerous, band film. This got re-released for a 25th anniversary, right around the time of Star Wars, got its 20th anniversary, believe it or not. And the John Waters one was a big deal in Baltimore, and it played at the Senator Theater, if you know what that is. And I loved always looking at what was playing at the Senator Theater, but I couldn't see Pink Flamingos, because I was 13. And I really, really wanted to see it. I so wanted to see it, and I couldn't. So I had a friend who had it on VHS, who had bought it, and I really, really wanted to see it, but I knew if my parents saw it, they were gonna take it away. So I knew how to copy tapes, and I knew I was gonna copy it, so I could watch it later while they were out. So I did that, then I hid the tape, and the copy was not labeled, because I knew if I labeled it Pink Flamingos, or if I labeled it something wrong, I would get caught. But for some reason, I couldn't if it wasn't labeled. This was my theory, and it actually kind of worked. I remember my parents, it would be with the videos and they wouldn't notice it, and I could just sneak it back into my room and they wouldn't know. I had a friend, Evan, who also wanted to see it, and to get it to him, I remember I got into his mom's car and kind of passed him this tape quickly before his mom could see. Everybody has to see it. It's like, it's amazing, it's disgusting. I have to try not to vomit. The interesting thing about the dog shit scene is that it's really kind of just put on the end of the film, and I guess theoretically, you could not have it in there but it's almost like the shit icing on top of the cake like I can't imagine the movie without it but it really has nothing to do with the film the first time I saw it I almost threw up John Waters actually gave out vomit bags during certain screenings of Pink Flamingos which I can understand and the first time I see it I like really had to stop myself from just throwing up all over my parents family room which I think would not have gone over well so I didn't throw up but I was in middle school and I didn't like middle school so anytime I wanted to stay home the thing is if you want to stay home from school kids if you throw up you don't have to go to school because no one wants to deal with that crap. So what I do is I'd have my breakfast, usually a bagel, go in the bathroom and just think of that ending and Pink Flamingos, the singing asshole or something, and I would throw up. For some reason, after I've seen the movie more recently, I don't get sick while I'm watching it, but later when I think about it, it's like the memories of the whole thing just like grosses me out. But I remember, I think I missed every Thursday in March of 1998 or something. I remember like I missed too many Thursdays and someone said something about, why did I pick Thursday? Why not Friday? I'm so lame. That is what happened. I'm sure if my parents see this, they're like not thrilled, but I passed, so it's okay, right? The thing about this film is it's like someone poking you. I said that about multiple maniacs, but this is so much more true. It's like someone poking you. It's like, are you grossed out yet? Like they're, they're fucking and there's a chicken between them. Are you freaked out? Are you offended? There's a singing asshole. Are you offended? Someone mailed someone a turd. Are you offended? Look at Edith Massey in a playpen. Have you, we freaked you out yet? It just like keeps pulling at that. And I think John Waters, it shows his true personality put on film because you can see that playfulness, that jokiness, that crazy dialogue in it, like the Eggman, divine speech at the end. All of it put together in this like beautiful package while I was getting into film. And one of the reasons I could get into this, and John Waters says it himself in Divine Trash, most of what they're doing is silly and stupid, like monkeys eat poop babies eat poop and divine a dog poop it's like silly things that they're doing it's understandable things it's like things you would think about to gross out your friends when you're that young and it's not like i'm saying it's unsophisticated because of that or it's lesser but in a way i think it made more sense to me than you know seeing an art film my dad showed me stuff like eight and a half i don't know if i really got eight and a half then but i definitely got pink flamingos i don't know if i should have been getting pink flamingos it doesn't take a lot to understand it it's so universal to be grossed out by it and disgusted by it. And this is the film that just set 
him off on this path to being John Waters. It's also the film that started his relationship with New Line Cinema and Bob Shea, which would be his distributor for the rest of his film career. They actually turned away multiple maniacs, but they took Pink Flamingos. Bob Shea was smart enough to realize he really had something here. It took him a while to figure out what to do with it, apparently, but when they got it going, they had it play at midnight shows for about two years, and it really launched the midnight movies. Things like El Topo did also. I always look at this one more of El Topo, maybe it's because I am from Baltimore and it had such mythic proportions to everyone and everyone had to have seen it and I heard about it so much. But to me, it was almost like the ultimate midnight movie. I remember one adult told me after he saw it, he walked home and he gagged the entire way home. He said it took him about four times as long because he had to stop so many places about to throw up because of that end scene. The infamy of this film keeps it alive and the fact that you know someone made this. Part of the thing with this film is that it really had a lot to do with me getting into movies because I got so obsessed with this film and Waters in general because of it. And I always see it every couple of years just as a cinematic palette cleanser, not because I'm gonna throw up all over the place but it's so kind of alive in it's like I don't fucking care this is who we are kind of spirit to it Waters maybe he never made a film as good as this and sometimes I do feel that way although I love a lot of his films but this is the film that will always stick with me and I think it'll always stick with a lot of people because most people remember gagging and remember the reaction remember being with friends and laughing and experiencing Divine and someone like Divine and Divine was a big change drag queen culture at the time everyone they want to dress like women but they want to dress like classy or like Miss America types and here comes Divine and Divine's not trying to exactly look like your mom or Miss America Divine's just an entity onto itself and you look at the outrageousness and the offensiveness of modern drag queens and I think you have to look at Divine as like the real beginning of that how many drag queens now say these out outrageous, ridiculous, over-the-top, melodramatic things, and then you look at Divine and you're like, oh, hey, wait a minute, this is exactly where all of this stuff came from. It's dangerous, it's different, it could gross you out, it offends you. There was even a time in the 80s after he made Hairspray that a family rented it because they liked Hairspray, and they actually called the cops because they were so offended by it. It has that notorious nature, it was banned in Australia, Norway, Canada, it just has that on it, and I don't see that from other midnight movies they represent something different and weird and strange but none of them ever like banned and got the cops called on them and like couldn't be released in certain countries and it still has that impact today think of how many films you read are banned and you see them and go well this isn't really offensive now so it doesn't bother me but pink flamingos is still like recently i woke up and the same kind of thing that happened to me when I was 13. I was thinking about it in the morning for some reason, and I almost threw up. It was like the most intense Pink Flamingos gag I'd have since the 90s. I watched it twice to do this review, and I think it's gonna be a bit before I see it again. It's still gross and like offensive and weird and strange and kind of ironic about what it's doing. I think that's one of the reasons I got into John Waters was because he came out of Baltimore, he made something that no one else could make, had his own kind of style, and there's only one of him. And it really just made me look at movies and go, wow you can have pink flamingos you can have spielberg you can have this you can have that and have classic hollywood and showing the difference and understanding you can have all sorts of different films opened me up to where i'm reviewing all sorts of different films now because i saw a thing like pink flamingos and had a big impact on my life and probably why i can be interested in animation and in live action because i accepted early on that filmmaking can be all these sort of things and pink flamingos represents that it represents being different and people say that about rocky horror also but to me it's like Rocky Horror is different, but it's still a musical. It can still be accepted. Pink Flamingos will always be that blank tape I'm passing to my friend so he can see. You'll see the divine pictures, but there's a lot of people who know that picture and like John Waters who have not seen this movie because they're scared. And I don't know a lot of movies that scare people anymore. It kind of make, makes me smile this kind of movie like it's so dangerous you can't even do it that's pink flamingos for me is that like people would look at you and go you watch those movies that's the thing i will always love about pink flamingos is that energy never really goes away from it and it showed john waters growing as an artist and a director made him a name it wasn't a huge financial hit because of the economics of the time and such but it gave him a name so he could keep making movies and made him the name and let him evolve to be the name he is today it's the film that really broke him and i think it's definitely the film that broke me as well to me it's so much of a cult film rite of passage if you really want to get into cult cinema 
this is the movie and this is the movie to endure and this is the movie to tell people like i have seen it i sat through it i saw it and i liked it that says more about you and how cool and hip you are than anything else that's what makes this movie just so amazing and so one of a kind and so unforgettable so if you have seen pink flamingos and you would like to talk about it then comment below in the comments and subscribe if you would like to